Hey, I'm Roland Mann, writer of Cat and Mouse, Trumps, and a host of other comics and editor. You probably remember me from Malibu Comics, but I run Silverline. You can find me on Twitter, YouTube, all the social medias. Look for Roland Mann, maybe Man Roland, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we're interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on this Geek Fest extravaganza slash conversation slash inside the actor's studio, but for comics and whatever else I'm doing. Who knows? After 15 years, it, it's all a blur. But we're joined today by a very talented, not only comic writer, but you may have seen his work in the 90s with Marvel and, of course, with Silverline Comics, as well as a, a bunch of other things that I'm sure his biography doesn't even come close to touching whatsoever because it's very extensive. We're joined today by the ever-talented Roland Mann. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? For those that don't know anything about yourself as a, as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. So most folks know me for my time that I spent in Malibu when I was an editor there. I edited uh, Dinosaurs for Hire, Protectors, The Ex-Mutants, until the Ultraverse came along. And then I jumped over to the Ultraverse and became editor. I edited about half the titles there. Sludge, Prototype, man, it's been, uh, been a minute. Strangers, Nightman, uh, edited some Rune. Um, ultimately, it, was, it, it ended up being about half of the, half of the line. Hank Knoltz, of course, was the, uh, was the line editor. Um, and so that's kind of where most folks kind of know my name from. But I, I started as a comic book writer in the late 80s. Uh, thank you to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the black and white boom, right? And my first book was a series called Cat and Mouse that ran for about uh, two years. And I, I like to tell people it, it garnered some critical acclaim at the time. We were in the top 10 black and white comics as notated by Comic Shop News for about half of our run. Highest we ever got that I'm aware of anyway is number four. That's kind of what got me onto uh, into comics was, was Cat and Mouse. Then I went on to write some other stuff, all independent comics. Most of what I was doing was for Malibu. And when Malibu got ready to expand, they were talking to me. And I said, because I'm, I'm a Mississippi boy, so I'm, I'm, I'm a Southerner. When Chris Alm mentioned that they were getting ready to build a staff, much like the Marvel had in the, the 60s and 70s, you know, the bullpen. Bullpen is probably the exact term he, he used. I'm like, man, that's that's my time. I love those those comics. That's how they ended up getting me to, to move out to California and join their staff there. And, and I loved my time at Malibu. Anyone who knows the Ultraverse story knows that Marvel purchased Malibu. Marvel declared bankruptcy about a year and a half, two years later, something like that. And that's when I lost my job uh, there. But that's also when I decided, hey, you know what? I, I know how to do this stuff now. Not only do I know how to make the comics, but I kind of know how to get them to market. So I lost my job at, at uh, Marvel. It was 96. I launched Silverline in 97. You've been doing this long enough to know you remember what happened in the late 90s. The, yeah. the, the industry crashed. Yeah. I lost a lot of money. And uh, my wife finally said, yeah, you can't be losing it. You're supposed to be making money, not, not losing money. So I called it quits in 2001. Uh, I went back to school, got a degree and started teaching, which is what I do with my day job now. I'm a university instructor. I teach creative writing. So that's how I, I feel my days. And then I tell people by day, I'm a university instructor and by night, I'm a comic book writer. There's so many avenues we can go into for sure, but let's let's talk about the Kickstarter because that's the most prevalent yes. thing yeah. currently right now. We'll, we'll definitely dive into the history as well too. Sure. And, and yourself as a, as a teacher because I think that's that's an amazing profession that's completely underrated as well. But looking at just at your Kickstarter campaign, mm -hmm. uh, usually when you have a Kickstarter campaign, it's usually just a single comic of some kind or an omnibus or an anthology. Or whatever. Yeah. But you have three comics in one campaign, so. That's amazing in its own right. <laughs> and secondly, <laughs> uh, it looks like you're going towards stretch goals as well, too. So first off, congratulations yeah. on Thank getting you. it funded. But tell us about this campaign and why it's so important that um, people should support it. Anyone who's listened to this knows a little bit about comic industry, I'm sure. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that people have a lot of options. Crowdfunding is, you know, it's an interesting thing. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. And I remember my first crowdfunder, I was like, I don't understand this. I don't know what this is. I don't know how this works. But this is my 19th campaign. What I've discovered is this is, I teach, I, I, I don't have a, 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 you know, as you can look around me, I don't have a big bankroll. 
Um, I don't have a, you know, I don't have a sugar daddy or sugar, sugar mama to fund the, the comic. So we kind of got to do what we can. And so when I discovered crowdfunding, I'm like, you know, this is interesting. Let's see what we can do because maybe we can get the funds that we need to print our books and still make comics. I love comics. I love the medium. I love the format. I love what you can do with it. I'm not a rich guy. So what happened is we started doing it. And it was like, hey, look, we we made money and I didn't lose money. And, you know, I made 40 bucks, but we were able to print the book. We were able to get it out. We were able to make a comic. People seemed to be enjoying it. Let's do it again. Right. <laughs> and so we did it again. One thing led to another. When I started doing this, I didn't start Silverline. That wasn't my intention. I'm like, I just want to make some comic books, right? I'm teaching. I want to make some comic books. I don't have the money to do it. So let's raise some money. What happened is people that I knew from my Malibu days, right? were like, hey, Roland, we saw this. I want to, you know, I want to work with you. I want to do this kind of thing, right? So anybody knew it. I'm a Southerner. I'm really laid back. My philosophy about comics has always been, let's have fun. Comics should be about fun. I don't, when you're done, I don't want you to be mad at me for reading the comic. I want you to read the comic. And when you're done and say, that was fun. I enjoyed my 15 minutes, my 20 minutes, my 30 minutes, whatever. I enjoyed my time there. I'd kind of like to have another issue. For me, my goal with this is not to incite you to, to go do anything. It's not, it's not propaganda in any kind of way for, for it. It's just fun, right? It's just, it's just fun. And I think that. A lot of folks that I worked with at, at Malibu was like, hey, well, I remember that. That was fun. Let's do some fun stuff, right? What started as one book turned into two, turned into three, turned into 20 books. And I'm like, we can't do this, you guys. I, you know, I have a job. I don't, my job is not to publish and edit comics. You know, my job is to teach, you know, creative writing. And it's like, I'll be honest with you. I didn't want to start uh, Silverline, but Barb Kalberg, Dean Zachary, and Kevin Gallagher, who were my, my art team for Cat and Mouse when we relaunched it, they're like, you should start Silverline back. And I'm like, nah, I just want to make some comics. I don't want to do that. Like, no, no, no. And of course, Barb's like, hey, I, I've got a story I would like to tell. And I'm like, you know, cool. you know I'm, I'm happy to help you out. Let's make that happen. And then Dean's like, well, I've got to, you know, I've got what I'd like to do. And I'm like, okay, well, again, it just, it just kind of blew up. And they're like, so I said this, if we're going to relaunch Silverline, you guys got to help me. Because I can't do it all because I do have a job. I still have a family, right? <laughs> so Barb, her first thing she said was, well, you know, I'm an accountant by day. And I'm like, really? <laughs> She's like, I can keep your books for you. And I'm like, okay, well, there you are. So, so that's what Barb, Barb keeps the books for, uh, for all of us. I don't have to worry about any of that. Of course, my wife does a lot of the stuff. She's bought in hook, line, and sinker. She does most of our social media. Uh, I have a lot of help now. And that's the only way that we could get to be doing about 20 books. That was a long-winded way to answer your question that, that is like, why three books, right? The reason three books is that we grew so much that we just started making comic books. And suddenly we're like, we have these comics. How, we can't kickstart. I don't have enough months to kickstart all the books. So we decided what we would do is we initially we were doing two books, right? Every other month. That way it would give us time to kickstart, fulfill, run another kickstart, right? A couple of months ago, we were like, we, we've got like five comics now. What are we going to do? And so we're like, okay, look, all of these are like science fiction books. So let's do all of these. It's like a science fiction Kickstarter. That was our last one, right? And so this one, you'll notice this it says, you know, Super One there. They're all superheroes. So we had the Switchblade, we had Teen Beetle, and we had Trumps, you know. Trumps is kind of sci-fi superhero. Um, so we're like, okay, we'll get these. I'm telling you our next Kickstarters are already scheduled for um, September. I've got probably five books that I can kickstart already. <laughs> I know it's it's crazy. So we're gonna finish out the year like this. We're gonna do some changes to our kick because I can't keep up. That's yeah. that's part. Of, I'm doing a Kickstarter every other month. I still teach. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to revise our Kickstarter schedule a little bit uh, next year to help me out, help the the scheduling out. But it's gonna we're gonna keep doing multiple books, and and the reason is is just we're making comics. <laughs> You've done. 19 plus Kickstarters. Yeah. You're, you're continuing to run Kickstarters. You obviously have learned something from doing this process multiple times and not bashing your head against the wall. So you've yes. obviously been successful in, in, in many cases. What have you learned from when you started originally, especially when you 
didn't understand the concept of, of crowdfunding to your current and maybe future state of mind when it comes to crowdfunding? I'll tell you, probably one of the biggest things that, that I learned, and it's funny that I had to learn this about crowdfunding because this is one of the things that I teach my my creative writing students, right? A lot, a lot of creative writing students, I'll set this up for you. A lot of creative writing students come into the class and they think, right, I'm going to write it and then it's just going to bloom into something. That's all I'm going to, I'm going to write it. And then someone is going to discover it. And whether it be a novel, whether it be a movie, what, no, no matter what, they just say, I'm going to write it. And then someone will discover it. And then it'll just go off and have a life that's all its own. And I won't have to do anything as the writer. Yeah. That's not the way it works. You've got to get out there. You've got to promote it. Well, I kind of thought the same thing about Kickstarter. I kind of thought, well, I'll just create the Kickstarter and people will magically go to it and, oh, no, that is not the case. You have to post and post and, and do interviews and schedule and post and, and remind people, hey, I got a Kickstarter. I got a Kickstarter. It is constant work just to promote that you've got it. That's probably the thing that I, I learned the most. The second thing I would say I learned the most was do as much of the prep work early on as, as you can. I've already got a good bit of the September Kickstarter built. It's not finished. It's not ready. On the platform, I have a, a good bit of it built already. Before, I was just kind of doing it all just a little bit before I started. That was very taxing. <laughs> uh, of course, the whole concept of running a Kickstarter campaign or any crowdfunding campaign for that matter, uh, it, it's a second job, literally. It, see what you just said there, right? So I'm teaching right during the day. Got these other comics, still being an editor, right? And I'm running the I'm running the Kickstarter. So, which is again why I said when when this first started, as I told them, I said like, I can't do this by myself, you guys. If we're gonna do this, I have to have some help. The biggest aid to me this time has been my wife jumping in. She's just jumped in feet first and is like, here, I can do this, I can do this. And she literally comes to me sometimes and she'll say, What can I do? What can I take off of your plate that I can do? Because there's some stuff that she, she's not a comic per She likes comics, but she's not a comic person, you know? So it's not like she can't, you know, ink her letter or anything, like but, but she'll come to me and she'll say, what can I do to take something off of your plate? She practically runs the social media now. I, there, there'll be times she'll say, hey, I'm going to do this. And I'm like, okay. I don't even look at it. I'm just like, yeah, post it, <laughs> make it, make it happen. Right. <laughs> I love it. Hey, yeah. you take help where you can get it. Obviously, That's exactly That's right. right. Well, the funny thing is, right. So she's, uh, we've been married for, uh, I'm having to do math now, 30, I got married in 90. So what does it be 20? So 32 years, right. We dated for seven years before we got married. So we dated for a long time. So she was with me. I actually proposed to her in my very first ever published comic. Nice. So if, if anyone has the very first version of Cat and Mouse number one, you will see my proposal to her in there. Uh, and it was funny because this was pre-internet days. <laughs> We'd get fan letters, letters you know, to the editor, letters to the creative team. And one of the most common questions that I got after that was, well, well what did she say? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the fourth issue, we actually published, my roommate at the time, Stephen Butler, drew a something for our wedding announcement. So we printed that in the comic and as a way to kind of let everyone know that this is, you know, she had, she had in fact said yes. Sorry, I have all my, my, my back issues down here of this cat and mouse. I think that's a number four. That's four. Ah, yeah, here we go. So this is the, the, the announcement that we had. This is oh. drawn by my, uh, my roommate at the time, Stephen that's Butler. Awesome. So yeah Love it. <laughs> yeah that's why i tell people i used to have long hair uh you know it was the 90s everybody had mullets in the 90s right <laughs> yeah i couldn't do that i i looked like albert einstein stuck a fork in a light socket <laughs> that's, that's the extent of my long hair but yeah it's it's amazing you know the the power of comics is is truly fascinating because it's one of those mediums where you can go back to it and see something new usually every mm. time you read it or you'll you'll notice something in the background maybe you didn't observe the first time or you see the style or evolution of a person's writing style or art yeah. style from the very beginning of a series to uh, the end if it gets that far type thing so looking at yourself as a creative person what is your creative kryptonite i want realistic dialogue that's 
still entertainment dialogue. So I, this is the thing, you know, I teach this in my class is that there are some instructors in the early part of the program that they tell their students they have to write dialogue that's real. My counter to that is like, whenever you hear real dialogue, it's boring, right? Don't believe me, go sit in a McDonald's and listen to the people behind you talk. The thing about it is you don't know who they are because, you know, we don't call each other by name when we have a, a, a conversation, right? We don't, Kurt, we don't call each other by name during our, our normal conversation. It just feels weird a lot of time. Now if we see someone from across, hey, Kurt, how's it going, right? Yeah. But, but during a normal conversation, but when you're writing entertainment, right, when you're writing comics, you have to do that, right? I think one of the things I struggle with is trying to make my dialogue sound real, but non-scripted. You know what I'm saying? And the other thing is, I'm a Southerner. I have to make sure all of my characters don't say y'all. <laughs> right they can't all they can't all enter the room and say hey how y'all doing right well actually you know i do set most of my stories in the south so that i can i i you know get most of my stories are set in new orleans so i can kind of get away with that sometimes probably that's my my biggest struggle is how do i put the words in the character's mouth to say what i want them to say to have meaning without overtelling the story but communicating and, and i will tell you this so I, I i'm one of those writers comic book writers I don't like a comic book that has no words in it, okay? I'm a reader. If I'm looking at a comic book and it has no words in it, I'm looking at a picture book. I'm not looking at a comic book, you know? I stopped looking at picture books when I was four. And then when my kids, when they age past, because I did look at picture books when I was reading to them, right? And I love art. Don't mishear what I'm saying. I absolutely love comic art. I could stare at comic book art for hours, right? But when I get a comic book, me as a reader, I want something to read. I want words to be on the page. I don't want it overwritten, right? I mean, I look back, I think of the, the Claremont Byrne X-Men. Those were great stories. If you look at them now, there's a lot of dialogue on those pages, you know? Now, here's the weird thing. In 1980s, when I was reading it, that didn't bother me a bit. I look at it today and I go, ooh, there's a lot of words on these pages, right? It's like, what's changed from then to now? that I read it and gobbled it up in the 1980s, but I look at it now and go, ooh, there's a lot of words on that page. What changed? I, I think it's <laughs> it's age and experience, really. I mean, we, we find we find our, t our tastes in what we like to read and what we'd like to see in terms of what our, whatever medium we, we choose to consume. But yeah. I think it comes back to you're expanding your, your mindset in, in terms of what you like. Like Claremont X-Men is a perfect example. It's, it's well-written. It's beautifully drawn like you could stare you could read it for hours and hours oh yeah and i think it's the same with alan moore's uh, watchman as well yep and that yep. you talk about dialogue verbose and narration verbose <laughs> it's, it's pretty pretty heavy yeah but in the beginning you you enjoy that type of stuff because it's like well i like superheroes or i like the x-men or i like this because someone else recommended it or right. i just happened upon it or a cover caught my eye or something and it's like this is exactly what i wanted to get my creative creativity going right yeah 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 and, and you know we hold you, you mentioned watchmen you know we hold as a as kind of a culture we hold watchmen up as like oh this is like one of the greatest uh, graphic novels of all time. I'm not going to debate that, but why is it that, that if we hold this up as one of the greatest graphic novels of all time, why is it that today we don't want someone to write like that, right? In, in the comics that are made today, we look at them and go, ooh, there's a lot of words on that page. You know what I'm saying? And I think as as general consumers, they look at a, a, a I mean, Watchmen has the, the, the name and the historical value to it. So yeah. it gets a pass, right? But if you were to take something and put the number of words on a page today and something, if I were to do that with like Cat and Mouse number four, people would look at, ooh, Roland, there's a lot of words on that page. You know, can't you cut some of them? <laughs> so I think there's a healthy balance for, for me, for the dialogue, particularly. That's one of the things that I, that I struggle with. I want there to be meat for the reader. So, you know, I don't want, I don't want my dialogue to, to repeat and, and same with captions. I, I don't really have a problem with doing with this caption. So it's the whole stereotypical, you see the image of Thor punching Hulk, mm -hmm. right? And the text reads, Thor punches Hulk with a mighty blow. Well, 
I can see that. You don't have to write that. That's one of the things that I don't want to do with my dialogue. I don't want them saying, you know, hey, pick that up or, you know, that kind of thing. I want to try to touch the things that you can't see things like smell or sound right there there's no sound in comics and 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 we kind of have a, a a fun debate back and forth with some of the guys at, at Silverland. we have one artist who uh, he, he did a 12 issue series um, a, a complete story he has no sound effects in it at all so we tease him that he's you know he's sound averse right well actually we tease him that he's, he's doing a silent comic which is not true because he has that you know they have dialogue mm -hmm. but um i think that's one of the vital parts of comic as sound effects it's, it's the show don't tell method is what it is yeah yeah exactly yeah and, and you know there was a lot of that in the, in the 1950s you did see some of that into the 60s and 70s i guess but but it was really prevalent in the in comics of the 1950s there are things that that you can't often hear if you hear a sound effect i don't know what that is right and, and i see this is one of the things i see in in, in script sometimes is just, you see a panel described and there's a wham it's like Okay, well, what made that sound? I don't know what made that sound, right? If it's not obvious in the panel art what made the sound, then you got to let the reader know somehow, you know? And so how do you do that without being too on the nose? Like a knock, knock, knock. Oh, someone's knocking at the door, you know? Better let them in. So this is one of the things I, I, I like to do. So, you know, one of the things I, and, and you may remember this too, one of the things I, I really remember about uh, Nightcrawler was his sound effect unique bamf yep. whenever he whenever he teleported but there was always what do you remember the smell sulfur. sulfur yeah yeah it was always the smell of sulfur how many other comics can you remember we could probably start making a list but <laughs> not many comics talk about smells like that these are the kind of things that a comic book doesn't naturally the senses that the comic book doesn't naturally do and so it's something that, that I want to try to do is that, okay, how can I hit these senses that the, because the, they can already see the art, right? With their eyes, they can already kind of hear the characters with the dialogue. How can I, you know, talk about these other senses that they don't get? You know, what about touch? What is, what is, what is Captain America's shirt feel like? You know, there's, there's always a debate. Is it chain mail? Is it, you know, every, everyone, because there's a little fish scales, you know, uh, what is it? What does it feel like? I don't, ever remember my whole time reading captain america i don't ever remember anyone ever talking about what that feels like do you no i, I don't because <laughs> because everything was directed towards the shield it was very it yes. was almost like wonder woman-esque in the sense that she could deflect everything all the art was geared towards what the object was deflecting yeah. off of and there was nothing yeah. about getting hit or or anything along that line yeah so it's amazing that you don't really think about the other senses when it comes to comics you're just so immersed in the story itself yeah. much like reading a, a book as well too you're subconsciously yeah. putting the scenes together in your mind as well so it yeah. kind of works out looking at the next generation of creative writers here what are you seeing that they're creating that makes you excited for the future of comic genre maybe Something I've always enjoyed is uh, I'm a science fiction fan, right? I, mm -hmm. I, uh, the science fiction is really kind of what got me into comics as a kid. Long story short, because I couldn't read, I was reading early science fiction, H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, things like that. Comics are dominated by superheroes. And please don't mishear what I'm about to say, because I love superheroes, okay? But comics have a superhero problem in that to those outside of us, they hear the word comic and the first thing that comes to their mind is Batman and, and Spider-Man, right? That's something that, you know, a lot of us in comics have always kind of wished. Well, we wish that you would understand that there's more to comics than that, right? Cerebus has been going for forever and it's not either one of those, right? What excites me is that there's a lot of science fiction that my, my students are coming up with. And I think some of that might be, this is, a, this is a purely conjecture on my part here, but I think some of it might be is because they get all the superheroes on the big screen movies. So they're kind of like, all right, I see the superheroes. I don't, I want to, I want to write something science fiction, you know, um, and that excites me. I like to see them grow the medium. If you study the history of, of comics, you know that that superheroes are popular, then they weren't, then they were, then they weren't. I don't know what phase we're in now as far as comic books, probably not superheroes, I would guess. If you look at the sales of Marvel and DC, you know, 
today. I mean, it, Marvel DC comic book sales are not doing very good today. You know, a lot of indi- independent comic books are, and many of those are science fiction, they're fantasy. Of course, you know, we won't know until hindsight, but I would kind of argue that superheroes are on the downswing for us today, right? That excites me. I, I, like, to, I like to see that. I, I think themes in creative and in writing in comics and in any medium are, are fascinating because it's mm. it gives a good mindset into not only what's happening in the world but what's also happening in the mind of of the people that are creating comics in that matter. And looking at your three comics currently in in the Kickstarter here, obviously they're of the superhero genre, which we yeah. just touched on. Uh, what were some of the themes that that spoke to you when you wrote? most of these comics. I wrote uh, Trumps and Switchblade, and then Team Beetle is written by John Growler. I think we get frustrated with authority. Uh, and I don't mean necessarily rebelling against authority. I think we get frustrated that, that we see authority not doing the things that they should do. I'll give a for instance, and and, and I'm, I'm, tr- I'm going to try to be very careful, not because I don't want this to turn this into the to like, you know, pro or anti anything, right? Um, like I said earlier, we just want to make comic books f- for fun. But you look at something like this, the Uvalde shooting, right? And I just saw the video two days ago and you see the authority go in there. What? They didn't do anything, right? They just stood around for, for, for far too long. And I think there's a frustration for me, right? And, and I think I feel that from a lot of people that I talk to is there's a frustration. Again, not that we rebel against the authority, but it's like, hey, look, you're the authority. Shouldn't you be doing what, what we expect you to do? The authority that we've given you, right? We've given you this authority. You need to do it. Certainly, that's what drove Switchblade, right? Uh, Switchblade is, is a story of a guy who gets frustrated with the justice system and decides to take justice. I don't, I'm going to say the law because he's not executing the law. He just decides to take justice into his own hands. And the story, when the story begins, you know, he's talking, he's chasing down a couple of uh, crooks who got off because uh, the policeman forgot to read them their Miranda rights. And everyone knows these two uh, were guilty. Not, not even a question of guilt, right? It's just that a technicality wasn't followed, and so they got off. Insert your own personal story there, whatever it is. We can all think of an example of which, when this kind of thing happened, right? And we get frustrated because we're like, that's not right. That's not right. We know that this person did this, and yet because of some failure in the system, this wrong is not being righted. And so this is this is kind of the 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 driving theme behind Switchblade, is that he's he's after the idea to to take justice into his own hands. And he's not sure, right? He he's just frustrated. He's not sure that that's the thing he should be doing. But frustration levels reach too much. And so he's like, I, I can do this, I'm gonna do this, right? Because I just feel it's the right thing to do. I think Trump's is a little little more lighthearted than that. Trump's is uh, the story. So my family, we play a lot of cards, okay? When I get together with my family, wh- one of the things we like to do is sit around the table and play card games. Of course, we talk while we while you know while we're playing cards. But you know, I, I come from a family of farmers, so we don't you know we don't play serious games. We play uh, things like Shanghai Rummy. We play Hand and Foot. We play Pinochle. Uh, uh, Pinochle is probably one of my one of my one of my favorite games. During one of our hard card, this goes back years right uh, ago. One of our card sessions. So so in Pinochle, some of the point cards. The way you get points is you ha- you have a, a king and a queen creates a marriage, right? You have a jack of diamonds and a queen of spades that creates something called the pinochle. And these these are how, if you get these two pairings, right, then you get points, uh, more points than, than your opponents. And then, of course, uh, if you bid on your hand, the person who wins the bid gets to determine the trumps suit, right? So I think it's 11 cards, right? You're holding 11 cards in your hand, right? If most of what I have in my hands is just, say, diamonds. I get to call diamonds trumps. A trump card always beats a non-trump card And when you're playing the hand, right? We got to play in this one. And I said, wouldn't it be you know, interesting if you know we're sitting here playing and that these, these were actually kingdoms and, and that we're like gods just determining their fates, you know? And of course, 
as the creative brain works that led from one thing to another, I'm like, you know, what if it really is, there's a world and there are four kingdoms and they're at war and these kingdoms are clubs and hearts and spades. And that's the, the impetus behind how Trump's got to be around. And of course, the title predates 2016. So it predates any American politics. <laughs> and it, so, and it has nothing to do Yeah pro con whatever you know it has nothing to do whatsoever with any of that but oddly enough that is something that we debated before we did it we're like okay so we know this has nothing to do with american politics do we change the name and we went back and forth on that just to having the discussions is you know do do we change the name because of that and and ultimately we we decided no let's keep it because if someone it's like oh Oh, you know, I hate Trump, you know, comic book. They pick it up, they're going to look at it, and they go, oh, this has nothing to do with it. This looks pretty good, right? I'm interested in this. Or, and, and then, in, in, in a, oh, I love Trump. Oh, this is, oh, you did a comic book about him. Oh, this has nothing to do with him. But this looks pretty good, right? So we, we opted to take the, the chance and roll with the title. And the good thing is, uh, the, the, what we're hearing is we, we've heard nothing but positive. We, we haven't heard any negatives yet. If, it, if people have had them, we just haven't heard them. My local comic shop, uh, has, has they always support, uh, Coliseum of Comics always supports our Kickstarters. He says that that's the one that they, they, they get it in and they sell it out. That's pretty exciting. What's the hardest part about being a, a writer? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end? of the process i think for me it's the end i love the beginning part that's the explosion of ideas right part of it is you have to get all those ideas down on you could see my desk here i just have like a stack of papers that <laughs> every time i think of something I, I jot them down and i also have uh, files on my computer that that i open up if i'm on my computer and I, i'll make notes on that's a fun process the process of actually putting it together to me is is a lot of fun i like taking the ideas and sculpting it into a story part of what i do when i write is that i know someone's going to draw the story right it's not a novel someone's going to draw the story. I've read comic books in the past that uh, were full of talking heads. <laughs> I'm an art lover, right? I, I love comic book art. And when I look at comic books that have nothing but talking heads, those are boring. They might be boring story-wise, but they're boring visually because there's just a bunch of characters sitting around talking. If that's all you're going to give me, then remove the pictures and just give me the words, right? <laughs> so I always know that when I'm writing a comic, but I'm also a writer and, and we want, you know, the characters to have depth and emotions and feelings and personality, right? So you have to give them some of those moments. So what I try to do is when I've kind of got the, the story, I, I look at what's happening. I'm like, okay, how can I here's the character learns something here. How can I put some action in this? How can I make, how can I create some movement, right? Not necessarily fighting, right? But how can I create some movement here that when the artist is drawing, he's not drawing talking heads. The artist that, that I work with, I want them to, much like uh, the, the reader, I want them to have fun, right? I want them to, to, when they draw it, I want them to say, this was fun. I want to draw some more of this, you know? If I've got, you know, 22 pages of talking heads, that's not going to be what they want to do right so you have to give them a, a mix and i think you got to give the 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 artist uh, freedom so that's the, that to me that's the fun part of the middle right you're trying to to get all of that put all that into place juggling the action with the slow scenes and the hardest part then is ending it right it's like how do i end it so that that the reader is satisfied so when the reader comes to the end he's like i'm satisfied that was a fun ride i am satisfied Think of it kind of like a, an amusement park ride. We recently went to Disney, so I'm, I'm thinking of these lines, right? You're in line, you're anticipating, right? You get on there, and man, you're on there for the ride, woohoo! And then when it's over, are you like, wow, that was a fun ride? Or are you like, meh, you know, eh. I want the reader to have that, that was a fun ride, I'd like to do that again. Right. And that's why I think the hard, the, the end part is the hardest for me, because ultimately, if you read something, I'm talking to you, too, Kurt. Like if you read something that I've written, I want you to come to the end and say that was fun. Right. Is it going to win any awards? Who knows? Who cares? I don't really care. But I want you to say that was fun. I kind of like to read another one. You know, that's what I've loved about just comics in general is and, and when this show got started back in 2008 we were we were specifically interviewing 
webcomic creators. So people that were only online. Okay. There was no real print on demand publishing or anything along that line, or at least not to the quality that there is today. Yeah. And everything was just via website. So I had over 4,000 webcomics in a, in a bookmarks list, literally. Wow. That I would go through Monday. It was categorized too: Monday, Wednesday, Friday, week by week, month, you know, how, what their update schedule was. I love the fact that no matter who I've talked to, whether they're a professional like yourself or Phil Folio or a bunch of others or brand new to the scene as mm. in they've just created their very first comic and they're trying to get some traction and promotion and all that other stuff. I love the fact that everyone that's come on, no matter what industry in entertainment, they're passionate about what they're doing, what they yeah. want to do, what they want to accomplish. And, you know, maybe they're down on themselves. And it's the fact that they're still, as a creative person, you still have the self-doubt. You still have oh, the yeah. imposter syndrome and everything like that. And being published as you have been in, in Silver Line and, and Marvel and everything like that, Malibu, et cetera, you know, I'm sure those thoughts cre crept up with you. And, oh, yeah. you know, it, they're difficult to shake. And I'm sure in today's... Uh, younger generation that are creative writers. I'm sure that's even more prevalent now than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I, I think you're absolutely right. You mentioned print on demand. I mean, print on demand has really changed the game. When Silverline did the, the late nineties, you know, after, after uh, Marvel let me go, uh, and I started, so you know, we had to go, you had a, a minimum print run of 3000 copies. Mm -hmm. If you were going to print a book, a comic book, you had to print 3000 copies. We did 13 books from 97 to 2001. I've already done So 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001. So four years, I did 13 comics, right? In the last two and a half years, we've done 30 books. Silverline has done 30 books. 30, Kurt. Holy crap. And it is only because print on demand. Print on demand allows me as a small press guy, I don't have to print, you know, 3000 copies of every book now. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I'd be sitting with a, a, a stacks and stacks of, of, I mean, you know, I would love to tell you that, oh yeah, I would sell out of 3000 copies. No problem. You know, we're small press. We don't do that. What's cool is that if 200 copies, boom, I print 200 copies. You know, if I need 500 copies, Boom, I print 500 copies because that's what I need. The other thing I love ab about Put On Demand, so we, we run the Kickstarters, right? And we fulfill, we have exclusive covers for, if you back the Kickstarter, you get an exclusive cover. Uh, who knows one day, are these ever going to be collectible? Eh, they may, they may not. I don't know. This is one of the things that we try to do for the Kickstarters is if you back our Kickstarter, you're going to get, you know, if you choose it, you're right, anyway, you can get this exclusive cover. And in a couple of months, you see me at the convention, you'll be able to buy the book but you don't get that Kickstarter exclusive cover, right? The thing I've enjoyed about the print on demand. Oh, look, I sold all my copies of cat and mouse. Number one printer. I need 25 more copies, 25. I just get 25. I order 25 more copies. They give me 25 more copies. I take those. I sell those out. I don't have to put a, a thousand, 3000 copies in my garage, right? I just print kind of what I need. I'm able to take those. You probably know what a lot of people may not know is that, the cost per unit is greater for, on print on demand. Yeah. So for instance, you might be able to print 24 page book. Uh, if you're printing 3000 copies, I, so I, I don't do black and white anymore because I can afford print on demand. I, I'll tell you the black and white prices, right? So in, in the nineties uh, and of course prices have changed, but in the nineties, you had to print 3000 copies. We could print our black and white comic for 75 cents a piece. Okay. Uh, per unit. Now you had to, or 3,000 of them, but you could print it for 75 cents a piece. Today, uh, with, with uh, print on demand, it's going to be more uh, more than double that, right? But I don't have to print 3,000 copies, right? Uh, let's see here, full color. Let's go black and white. Let's go 24 pages. $2.40 <laughs> per unit, right? So uh, I can print a I can print a 24 page comic, black and white interiors, cover color. For two dollars and forty, so we'll just say two fifty, right? That's more than double, you know. So you have to consider the profit is not as great per unit. I can print three thousand of them, and when I sell a book, I can, I can make a greater profit. Of course, I, you also probably know that in the days of Diamond, your seventy-five cents. If you're asking two fifty for that, 
Diamond's going to take most of it, and you're still only going to get about a dime for it. This is part of the problem with the pricing. And it wasn't just Diamond. When I first got in, there was Diamond, Capital City, you know, Friendly Franks, all that kind of stuff. Praising print on demand has changed the game. Yeah. (laughs) So, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I learned that language had power. Probably as a kid. One of my all-time favorite books, Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage. When you can read something and be emotionally moved by what you read, that's powerful, I think. People who know me have probably heard my story before. Uh, I was not a reader as a kid. I, 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 you know, I come from a family of farmers. Um, my dad was not a farmer when I was a kid, he's a farmer now, but he was not a farmer when I was a kid. In early school, I, I didn't I didn't want to go to school. I just wanted to go outside and play. I wanted to throw dirt clods at the cows. I wanted to, you know, swim in the pond. Uh, you know, I, I just wanted to be outside and play. And so I began to fall behind in school just because I just because you know I wouldn't do anything. And so my mom was the one who who, who saw it. My mom's an avid reader. She's fast, fast, fast. I I still doubt I don't read as fast as my mom. But she's the one who who sought out ways to get me in, in, into to reading, which is how I discovered comics, got into other kinds of reading. But one of the, one of the early books that I discovered was the, the Red Badge of Courage. And of course, I got interested in the, you know, the American Civil War and history and that kind of stuff. But I can just remember that it moved me emotionally, even as a, you know, as a, uh, not a young kid, but as I, I can't remember exactly how old I was, 10, 11, 12, something like that. I don't remember. But I was like, wow this is all make believe. And I remember the first time I read it, I I kind of read it assuming it was real. And then I realized, no, it's not real. It's just, he just made this up. This is, this is not a a real character. Um, The events, you know, this, the American civil war was real and he never, he never mentions that it's the battle, you know, of Manassas or Bull Run. You know, he, he never, he never mentions that. Apparently, a lot of people kind of know that 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 was the the inspiration. I didn't know, of course, as a kid, but I think that's when I realized this is powerful because it, it moves me. I think kind of what we want to do for entertainment, that's what we want. We want something that kind of moves us, right? We want something that makes us feel. Why is O'Yeller so so popular? It's kind of, well, it's because you, you know, it makes us feel something. It makes us feel emotions. When you can do something that resonates with the reader. One of the things I, I, I like in, uh, as you, you, you probably got, you know, I'm, uh, family's important to me. Um, and, and so one of the things I like to try to do in, in my stories is, is make sure there are family connections, family ideas, even if they're dysfunctional, right? Because we all got families, right? They might be dysfunctional. They, they may be non-traditional, but we all have them. So I like to try to, for me as a writer, these are the things that I, I want to try to get into my writing because I feel that that's where I can make that connection with, uh, with readers. So a long-winded way to say, I, I think it's probably um, Red Badge Courage when I was when I was a young reader it made me realize that, and then it wasn't too long later that I read um, Huckleberry Finn. Now, now that's that's a much more difficult, and I, I struggled with Huck uh, the first time I, I read Huck and didn't appreciate it for all it was uh, at, at the time. Now I do, but it was a, it was a much harder read than uh, the Red Batch of Courage. Red Batch of Courage is an easy is an is a very easy read, and I would recommend it to anyone who's you know who's of your reading age. Huckleberry Finn, no, I probably wouldn't recommend and recommend that until people get to be I don't know 17, 18, 19, maybe even a little bit older than that. I remember diving into Mark Twain's work and, and Huck and all that other stuff, and it's almost on the level of Tolkien in the sense that it's very verbose and very in-depth into the details that they describe yeah i'm not saying they're definitely two completely different genres that's for yes sure. so funny story i'm gonna segue here on you so funny story uh when i got out of comics one of the things i looked at uh, doing is going into um going into traditional uh publishing printing prose write novels and that kind of stuff and so i attended a lot of uh, writers conferences and one of the things that i i frequently heard editors saying was read the classics read the classics read the classics so when i got my degree right 
my degree is in early American, um, it's in English, right? But early American literature. So Mark Twain, James Fenmore Cooper, these people like that. Now I enjoy them. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I enjoy them. But if you wrote like James Fenmore Cooper and submitted your book today, no one's going to buy it. No one's going to buy it. It takes Natty Bumpo 20 pages to cross the stream. <laughs> Nobody wants to read that today. You're right. They, they, they spend a lot of time describing things. Our, our audiences today do not want that. But I do absolutely, I, Mark Twain, I just brilliant. You know, um, a lot of people don't realize Mark Twain, he was a, a confed, in the Confederate militia in Missouri very briefly. Uh, I think they he, they had a couple of skirmishes and then he just said, screw this, I'm out of here. And he, he went to uh, uh, California, I think San Francisco and became a, a newspaper guy. <laughs> so one of my favorite pieces of, uh, of Mark Twain is um, The Literary Offenses of Fenmore Cooper. Have you ever read that? No, I haven't. Oh my gosh. So it's a long essay. You don't need to read the whole, whole essay, but he just, uh, I highly recommend it. As soon as we're done here, go Google. It's, it's, it's you know, public domain now. It's the Literary Offenses of Fenmore Cooper by Mark Twain. And he just proceeds to list the things, right? And, and of course, once he gets to the end of the list, that's where he begins to, to go the essay. But just read the list. You will be dying laughing. It's particularly if you read Fenmore Cooper and you know the kind of writing. One of the things is something like, you know, every story should have a plot. <laughs> They're really, really funny. Uh, oh, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, do, do, yeah. I said, you don't have to read the whole essay, but just go through and read his list. And, and they're really funny. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? <sighs> one person. Well, that'd be hard for me to say one person. I, yeah. I, I will say this though, as a high school senior, so my mom, obviously, is very instrumental in, in my reading, right? As far as a writer, as a high school uh, student, I was into all the sports, right? I played all the sports. You, you can't see it from me sitting down, but I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a big guy. I'm six foot, almost six foot four. You know, I had loved comics, even, even into high school. I was the, of course, I went to school, you know, in the 70s and, and early 80s. So I was kind of that guy who sat in the classroom, you know, had the, the textbook held up here, but had the comic book, right? That was me. Now, unlike Peter Parker, I never really got picked on. Again, I think some of that was because I'm, I'm six foot four. So never, no one really picked on me, you know? Um, I, I would get, yeah, I played football. And so I would get, you know, the occasional ribbing from the guys on the football team, but it was never, it was never something that uh, no one ever beat me up or anything. It was just kind of teasing. Right? It was words, but it's kind of teasing, right? So it never really bothered me because I liked comic books. And so I should, I, I guess I probably shouldn't say it never really bothered me because I did hide the blast more I hide from my teacher, I guess. But, <laughs> but uh, so I wanted to do this, right? It, it's something that, that, that I, I, I did. And so I took a creative writing class. I needed uh, an elective as a senior to graduate. And the teacher I had was so inspirational. She was so encouraging. She would take the stuff and that, that was bad, but she would encourage me. She, and she would say, hey, you've got a gift for this. You've got a talent. You need to do this. And other than praise from my family, which, you know, I mean, you kind of expect that from your family. No one had ever done that, I don't, I don't think. And, and the thing about it is I had kind of wanted to do this, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to voice it. I didn't know how to pursue it. I'm a first generation college student. I didn't know how to pursue it. I didn't know how to do any of that. So I would say that Miss Keaton was probably uh, very instrumental in getting me on this path obviously you know she's she's not there you might have been looking for a writer who in inspired me but but i'm going to say uh, miss keaton because she encouraged me and probably planted the belief in me that i could actually be a writer from a professional standpoint you have been creating comics for over 30 years you have been an editor a writer and made many professional connections in your time as well as made many friends in your time as well too and sold many comic books in that regard so professionally you are successful do you consider yourself personally successful Ooh, that's interesting um that that's an interesting that's a deep question because i think my answer is yes and no we, we talked about this a little bit earlier i look around me and I've been married for 32 years. 
I have two kids, neither of whom are in jail. I speak to both of them still. Uh, they both still speak to me. They both still speak to their mom. I still have a relationship with my parents. My wife still has a relationship with her dad. Her mom died a few years ago. She still has a relationship with her dad. I, I look around me and say, I, I have a roof over my head where again, I'm, I, I'm a teacher, so I don't have, you know, I, I, I don't have much. I'd like my house to be bigger. I'd like my car to be newer. I'm driving a 1998, you know, uh, truck. But I look around me and I say, yeah, you know, this is this this is what success is. I, you know, I have a family who loves me and I love them. And, and that's that's success. And I get to make comic books, which is, you know, part of what makes me happy. But now here's the other part of it. Right. I I look particularly and, and, and creators are, are, you know, creators are want to do this. And, and, and I know we shouldn't. I look at what I do and then I look at other crowdfunders that are out there. And I look at even just Marvel, DC books, right? I look at other comic books that, that, you know, we know some of the sales figures of, and I look at some of them and I'm like, how is this book? How am I not getting my stories into as many hands as this book is, right? Like many creators, I, you know, I inevitably compare what I have done to, you know, this particular thing or this thing here or this thing here. And I'm like, how did this book get you know 300 backers i don't understand how those 300 people are backing that but they're not gonna back my comic because i've read that one <laughs> right and i'm like did you really like that it was was that what does that what did, why did you back that and and i you know I, you know i get it people telling me well you shouldn't be so judgmental and, and I, look, I get that whatever but you know at some point in time we do have to say we do have to be able to agree that there are some things that are good and there's some things that are not right we can't just say everything is because it just doesn't work that way, right? And, and and don't again, don't mishear me. Don't don't. I'm not trying to gatekeep and keep people out of out of comics or at, at all. But I've been doing this long enough to know that some of the stuff that's published, you just look at you like, how did this get published? Why did this get published? Who's buying this? You know. And so that's some of some of what I look at and say, well, you know, maybe I'm not successful, you know, because. I don't know, was, was my Kickstarter at? Uh, I think the last time I looked, you know, we had made, but uh, I think we had 58 backers. So please don't mishear me. I am appreciative to every single person who, who backs the, the the Kickstarter, who believes in me, not just me, but in, in, in the other, in the people that I'm working with enough to to put money down. And we'll sell, we'll sell copies at conventions. I, I absolutely know that. I've got, you know, I do a lot of the local shows here in Florida. We got comic cons all the time, right? So there are people I, I can count on oh, at this con convention. I know that this person, this person, this, I know that these people are going to show up and they're going to buy my latest books because they don't do Kickstarters, right? So they'll buy my, my, my newest books. Um, I know that the, the Coliseum of Comics, again, like I, I mentioned earlier, he's always getting, uh, a, you know, a stack of comics and moving them. Now, I don't know who buys them. Um, not like I do at a convention. I, you know, at a convention, I, I have that one-to-one -one connection with them. But when I sell to a comic shop, I don't, I don't know who it is. It's a two-part answer, yes and no. I'm not an unhappy guy at all. You know, like, but yeah, I, I wish I wish I knew how to get my my work in in more hands. I, and it's a failing of me. You know, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to get my content into more hands that that, that I think would like it. You know. Well, so. but that's that's comes back to social media, and that comes back to mm. promotion, and that comes back yeah. to doing shows like this. And, yeah. and there's, there's a whole other avenue of, of things, like especially from a writing perspective, and, and this happens a lot. Like if you put together quick video clips of what you're doing or your process. Now, as a writer, I'm sure it's not as exciting as you know seeing an artist do something, right. but it's still- Here's me typing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> See, here's me pecking away at a, at a keyboard. You know, I, don't have a th I don't have a thousand monkeys, but you know- <laughs> Here I am. Uh, right. But you could do something quick and simple of, of maybe common yeah. questions you get from students. And you put together yeah. that in a quick a one minute video clip. You get. Have you been talking to my wife? <laughs> that's, that's, she's this, been saying that. Take your yeah. wife's advice and, and start yeah. doing something like that because that's the only way that you're going to generate people to get yeah. more eyes on you. And the fact that you have a professional background, not only in comics, but as a teacher as well, you have extra clout. 
I, if that's still a word. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have the ability to be an expert in your own field. So unlike myself, who's a host, who's only been interviewing people, the only thing I can do is take your interview, <laughs> put it together in, in a bit bite-sized bits and post it on TikTok or Instagram or, or whatever else I have here to draw interest into the interview. Do I have time to do that? Fuck no. <laughs> do I yeah, want to at, do that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you've been looking, I mean, I, I think you got to look at this. You've been doing this for what, 15 years? Yeah, 15 in uh, August, yeah. Yeah, I mean, how many others can say that? I, I, would, I would be willing to bet not many. There's, yeah. So the only, so here's the kicker with all of this. <laughs> this is a quick segue. Is I was around before Mark Maron in what the fuck podcast and i was uh -huh. around before joe rogan <laughs> yeah i don't have their comedy backgrounds and i don't have their money so right. <laughs> isn't it funny how money runs so much stuff that's a pain and i'm it candy is. too so i'm like half the u.s dollar so you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm cheap go figure <laughs> I didn't say I'm uh, not a comedian. I have comedy chops. I'm just saying. You know, I, I should point out, since you mentioned the Canadian, uh, that uh, Switchblade is drawn by uh, a Canadian. A who? A Leonard Kirk. Oh, yeah. I've had, I've had Leonard on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Leonard. Uh, Leonard. Guy. This. Uh, yeah. Leonard. Uh, he, he's, he was a penciler. So. Yeah. He's, he's a, a true talent. Amazing. Yep. Like, yep. Yep. I've known Leonard for long, for many years. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, man. I always try to figure out what did I do wrong? Of course, you know, we talked about you know, sports in, in, in high school. I coached my kids uh, when they I coached my daughter uh, in softball for six years before she joined the high school team. I uh, coached my son for five years before he joined the band. Um, he decided to, to give up ball and, and uh, join a high school bit, which I was fine with. I, I, not a problem. But one of the things that I, I always told them as a coach, I don't know that it's politically correct to say anymore, but, it, you know, it was, I always told them, you know, hey, we don't quit until the fat lady sings. And I would tell them, I don't hear a fat lady singing, so it's not time to quit. And maybe it's the teacher in me that, that's coming out. You know, I, I mean, I didn't start life saying I wanted to be a teacher, right? That's not where I was. I wanted to be a writer. I kind of segued into teaching because I realized at Malibu, I ran the intern program. And a lot of what I did in the intern program was teach, right? I taught them how to do a lot of the things that, that we did. And I realized that I enjoyed that. And I was actually going to go be a history teacher, not a creative writing teacher, but that's another story. You know, obviously, I don't hear any fat ladies singing yet, you know, for, for you know, my failures. What I try to do is say, what did I do wrong? And I, and, and I don't want to, you know, I try not to ever blame anybody else because I think that's, that's a horrible path to go down when if I've failed at something for me to try to blame someone else. I always try to look at what did I do? What did I do to cause this to, to, to fail? What can I do better when I do it again? Because I'm going to do it again and I'm going to try to do it again. So how can I make sure I don't fail the next time? You don't know me. So uh, yeah, it's easy for me to sit here and say, but I am the eternal optimist. I tend to be optimistic about the overwhelming majority of things i i believe that's 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 the kind of people i like to hang around i like to hang around optimistic people because they have they tend to be more fun hey, people who are pessimistic are always like eeyore no one wants to hang around eeyore right so why be an eeyore now do i ever get uh, bummed about it do i get depressed yeah i am one of these who believes when something hurts like failure does you cry right? Mm -hmm. It's your crime done. And then get up, move on. If I fail on this thing uh, tomorrow, then I'm going to go and I'm going to cry about it the next day. And I'll spend the day crying. And then that will be, you know, then I'm going to say, okay, I'm done crying. Now I, I got to, I got to move forward. I think if you cut that crying part out that you're, you're, you'll bottle it in and you won't be able to deal with it again. This goes back to emotional, right? I think some people dwell on the crying too long. You know, if they're still crying a month later, I'm like, okay, well, wait, that's way too much. You know? Yeah. Okay. Be sad about your failure. Be uh, this thing that you failed at, right? Be, be, be sad, be upset, be hurt, right? Do all these things express those. 
but don't dwell there, right? You ever been mud riding? Mud riding, like getting in a big truck with big wheels and just going riding in the mud? Oh, no, not not by choice. I think okay. It just happened. <laughs> okay, did you get stuck? Probably, yeah. More than okay, likely. when you're in the mud and you get stuck, the tendency to, ha- to, to happen when someone gets stuck in the mud is to do what? Just sit and spin, right? This is the way I look at responding to failure. If you just sit and spin in your failure, what's going to happen? What, what happens to the hole? Oh, it just gets deeper and it gets deeper and deeper and it gets harder and harder to get out of that hole. So I, I would never say don't mourn or or cry or or be sad, but don't sit and spin in it. Because if you do, you're just gonna dig that hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's harder to get out. So yeah, I, I like to try to self-reflect. What did I do wrong? How can I not do that the next time? And do I need help? Right. Do like like, like I mentioned the silver on earlier. When they started talking about uh, relaunching Silverline, I'm like, okay, well, I remember what I did in the, in the late 90s, right? And I had fun, don't get me wrong, but I lost a lot of money. And, and so, I, you know, I wouldn't have done this without print on demand because I don't have that kind of money to spend, right? So now I probably wouldn't have done it without Kickstarter. I, I can't say that for certainty um, because I don't know, but Kickstarter allows me to raise the funds to print the print on demand stuff and I don't lose money. Now, am I making money? Well, like I said, you know, I'm making $40 here and there, uh, but I'm not losing money, you know, and, and that's, I'm not losing money and I'm able to continue to do this thing that I like to do. That's one of the things I've learned from the, from the nineties is I can't do that alone. And so I, I got to have help. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you've had not only the younger generation with your kids, as well as the fact that you're teaching the younger generation. So you got a two for there, uh, going about when it comes to being creative, you are inspiring them in some way, shape or form, similar to how your teacher inspired you. Yeah. But how can the younger generation inspire the generation that follows them? A handful of things, actually. I, I don't think there's any one single ingredient. I think there's a, a, a handful of things they can do. The first thing they, they, they can do, I think, is be uh, encouraging, right? And that's what I look at when I mention, you know, Miss Keaton. She encouraged me. I have to, I'd have to dig out that writing. I, I, it can't have been that good, right? She she spotted something. I don't know, uh, but she encouraged me. And so I, I think uh, to, to be encouraging, right? The, the other thing is, I think to be instructive. Man, there's so much the teacher comes out in me. So I'm not a big fan of participation trophies, okay? My kids were both kind of in the, the generation of participation trophies, and we, we talked about a lot of that. And I think one of the things that that does is it gives false hope, maybe, in that, false uh, assurances. So not everybody can do everything. And that is okay, right? I can't draw. That used to bother me, particularly as someone who loves comic books, that, that, that I couldn't draw used to really bother me, but that's okay. I also can't, you know, run a 40-yard dash in, you know, four seconds, right? <laughs> 4, 4.4. I can't do that. Never could. Not even when I was, you know, younger and in shape. I, I think what we, we have to, to do is encourage and remind them that they can't do everything, that they might want to be, a, I used to want to be a rock star, by the way, they might want to be a rock star, but since they can't play guitar, what are they going to do, you know, and they're not willing to put in the time. The other thing is, is, is time, I think, remind the next generation that they have to practice. I see so many students come through my class and several of them think, All I got to do is finish this program and get my diploma, and then I will be a writer. That's not the way it works, right? And just even outside of my classroom, right? I see so many writers who think all I have to do to write is sit down and type. That's that's typing. That's that's not writing, right? That's typing. There's so much more that goes into writing than just typing. So I think we have to encourage and instruct and remind them that there are 
things that they might not be able to do. You know, comedy, comedy is hard to write. People have told me before, I don't consider myself a comedy writer, but people have told me before that some of my characters are funny and that they laugh. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, th that's cool. I'm not really writing a, a comedy story, but if you're laughing, I'm, I'm okay with that, right? This this character can be funny. I attribute a lot of that to the art sometimes because I'll, I'll try to describe, hey, this character does this thing funny, and then they'll draw it that way and it looks funny, right? So you'll laugh at it. Yeah, so encourage them, instruct them. I think encouragement is probably the stronger one because you want to encourage the next generation to do it and try it. The thing about it is try it. You don't know if you're going to be any good if you don't try it. Don't just mean writing. I mean, this could be with anything, you know, it's like, well, you don't know if you're going to be any good at the piano if you don't sit down and try. You don't know if you're going to be any good as a basketball player if you don't get on the court and shoot some hoops. You know, you don't know if you're going to be any good as a comic book artist if you don't try to draw some pages, you know, try it. What's it going to hurt? So you, you spend some time trying something. Okay. Well, now it's an experience that you have that you can say, you know what? I tried to do that. I wasn't any good, but I tried it, you know, is that no. inspiring at all? No, that's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you could, you're able to list off things that, that people are, people should look out for and that should, they should do in their lives to better themselves. It's, it's all, it's all great information and that people may not have realized or maybe they needed to be told you know yeah it, it works out yeah well i, th I think I, you know I, it's, I like i look at you and i think you're inspiring no seriously <laughs> uh, you know 2008 yeah. to now yeah. that's a long run dude <laughs> <laughs> I, I have the gray hairs on my temples to prove it <laughs> That's a long run. To me, that's inspiring. If someone wants to look at something that's successful, look at you, right? What did you do? Well, you stuck to it. You did it, yeah. <laughs> right? There, there's a lot of that. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. One of the things I tell my writers, some, some, my, my, my students sometimes, is that the difference between the successful writer and the unsuccessful writer is the successful writer did it and stuck to it. Yeah. The unsuccessful writer did it, didn't work out, gave it up. I completely agree. And there are times where, especially if you're if you're only one person doing this, and, mm -hmm. and I think this would be, and I've interviewed authors as well in, in the past too, and the perseverance needed to finish something. And I yeah. think that's something that people, a lot of people today aren't able to do is because of the way society is, because of the instant gratification of social media and of posting something to get a like or to get a comment right. or to get something. And yet you're one person out of 7 billion plus right? trying to do something creatively. You are a small speck in a large ocean. Right. And to, to get past that mindset is difficult for a lot of people and, and perseverance in doing what you're passionate about and then attempting to turn it into a career, to turn it into something you can get paid for. Yeah. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. That yeah, but that's, but that's the thing is that, that you, you're you doing something that you enjoy. Clearly, you enjoy this. You, you do something that you enjoy and you stick to it, right? That's amazing what makes you a success. People. Exactly. But I've met yeah. some amazing people and that's the main thing. It's like these conversations wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have learned about your life. I wouldn't have learned about your struggles or you learned about your successes without doing this show. Yeah. I, I love it. I, I just love that people are taking the time to promote themselves. And I'm yeah. glad that I have a platform that's able to at least help them a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, you know, I, I, I have no qual I'm clear. I would clearly, you know, again, point to you as a success. This is, you know, your success. I'm going to cut this and send it to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> see, mom. <laughs> see, see, Roland said I was a success. See? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. She, she, she likes what I do. It's just, she, she's wondering when's the paycheck type deal. Oh yeah. Something like this. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I feel you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was, it, it was so exciting. It was so exciting when, um, because when uh, Marvel bought us, right? When Marvel bought Malibu, Spider Man was literally on my paycheck, oh, right? Wow. And this was day in the day of paper. You know, yeah. we still got, you know, they still handed you a paper paycheck, right? And so my very first check that had Spider Man on it, I went and made a photocopy of it <laughs> and said, Look, mom, Spider Man is on my paycheck. <laughs> I have to have you back on and before I ask my last question. 
Okay. I do have to have you back on because I'd love to talk about Marvel Women IDs. And, sure. And of course, Malibu and everything like that. You you have such a historical knowledge that is, is needed in today's world because I think a lot of people either have not lived those decades, yeah. at least that are creative currently, or they just don't realize what they're creating has roots. Right. And yeah. That they need to look back like what you did with American literature and, and yeah. early American history as well. You look back at the past so you can either make yourself better or you can make, you know, your creative works better in some yeah. way, shape or form. Yeah. I, dude, I'm, I'm happy. Just, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I like to talk about the, you know, things that I like and I, I, comic books is one of them. I loved my time at Malibu. Um, you know, when people ask me, uh, you know, about Silverline, I say, you know, one of the things I would love to do with Silverline is, is to kind of recapture the spirit that Malibu had. Malibu was lightning in a bottle. I, I believe that. And I'll never, you know, recapture it because they had an office. Well, I don't have an office. I mean, this is my, this is an extra room in my house, right? That is not going to happen. But if I could recapture anything about Malibu, it'd be to recapture that spirit that Malibu had. And, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job. Like, there's a whole bunch of ex-Malibu people working with me. So that helps, right? So, but, and so I think we were doing a pretty good job of kind of capturing that spirit of independence that, that, that Malibu had, but I would love to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And because I like music as well, what would its soundtrack be? Ooh, soundtrack would be easy, the first easiest one for me to uh, answer. So uh, I'm a metalhead. I, I progressed from from the the heavy stuff, uh, Led Zeppelin, Queen, Aerosmith, uh, that kind of stuff in the 1970s. I still listen to that stuff. Oh, yeah, but I've, I've, I've moved. So you listen to it as well? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, very cool then. I have progressed a little bit to prog rock now i didn't know it was called prog rock until i heard someone call it that apparently yes and rush um those are progressive rock right so uh i listened to a, a guy now by, now by the name of uh, neil morse a lot he mm -hmm. uh, he was with his drummer was with uh dream theater i listen to a lot, a lot of that I, I don't like screamo screamo metal i like to hear voices and, and melodic metal right that would be uh, my soundtrack. Some of my favorite soundtracks would be like uh, Queen for Flash Gordon or Queen oh, for yeah. Highlander, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Great soundtracks. Uh, the heavy metal soundtrack, uh, another good one. Mm -hmm. So that would be my soundtrack. The title, Andy Griffith Makes, makes Comics. <laughs> <laughs> That's new. I was told not too long ago, I was like the Andy Griffith of comics because I was just, hey, yo, come on in. Let's make some comic books. You know, that is very much my attitude. You know, let's uh, let's let's have fun. Let's make some comic books. Clearly, I'm not Andy Griffith. That maybe encapsulates the attitude, the tone. <laughs> but it's just a fun question at the end because usually I go a little more introspective in the second. But yeah, we, we yeah. touched on so many great topics and it's going to be fun to get this posted as well too before i let you go okay thanks again so much for coming my show oh, i do greatly appreciate it here thank you for having me where can we find you how can we support you and of course uh, obviously yes the kickstarter link is down below but are there any other websites or social media you want to promote absolutely yeah uh so silverline is uh, where i try to push people to i do have my own personal social media silverline is uh, where i try to uh, push folks to and we we are on instagram we're on facebook we're on uh, twitter just look for silverline comics i am also on all the social medias i'm on instagram Twitter. We stream, Silverland streams. We have three stream teams. We have a Sunday night stream, which is the one I generally participate on, Sunday night, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Then we have a Tuesday night uh, stream that's on 8 p.m. Pacific time. And this is for most kind of caters to our West Coast uh, folks. And then we have uh, a Wednesday night crew that I sometimes join that's on uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern time as well. Except for me and one other that kind of hops around a little bit depending on what week it is but they're, they're different crews we've just blown up in the number of creators a lot of people come on but we stream and we talk about uh, all kinds of geeky stuff we don't take ourselves uh, too seriously uh dean might sometimes dean gets serious uh dean zachary who uh, you might remember for uh, was a penciler for uh, nightman for the ultraverse and he did um uh he did the ferret 
Um, so sometimes Dean gets a little, little deep. It's all in good fun. We're a group that likes comics. We like to talk about comics. It's easy to sidetrack us. If you happen to come on to any of our live streams and you start asking us questions, man, we're going to chase your questions and we'll go. So that's where you can find us. And you mentioned the Kickstarter. That one's live to the 24th. And then we've got a, we'll do another one in September and then another one in November. Uh, for 22. Um, we, we do short Kickstarters. We do 21 days. Uh, we don't run them for the full month, mostly because uh, we do them every other month. And so we try to finish them so that we can print and ship them out and fulfill them before we run the next one. That's our, our goal. We don't always make that goal of uh, fulfilling the last before we launch the next one, but that's what we try to do. Go to the Kickstarter, uh, support us if you can. Uh, one of the things we do on all the Kickstarters is is uh, we always offer back issues. So uh, this Kickstarter features, for instance, Trump's number three. Nobody wants to jump in on Trump's number three, but you can get one and two easily part of the Kickstarter, and as well as all the other uh, Silverline uh, back issues. Yeah, we've got a couple of trades. We're still working our way to the trades, right? Because what we do once we finish a mini series, we'll we'll collect it into a trade. So we don't have that many yet. We're getting closer and closer to having more as we as we begin to wrap up some of the the mini series. Team B and Switchblade both are three issues total. This is the second issue of, of those. Switchblade number three is already finished. I think I told you earlier, we already got, uh, but number three is already finished. Uh, Trump's number four, which is the final issue of that one, is about 60% done. Once those finish, then we're going to have, you know, more and more trades that we'll add to, uh, to our list. But right now we've just got a couple. Well, Roland, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. I, I, I had a blast talking with you. Well, you can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. If you do the number two, you really haven't been following me all these years and I'll be very disappointed in you. And I'll have to, you know. I have to look down on my glasses like this. <laughs> but that's beside the point. You can, of course, find this interview as well on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated than our website because I'm having website issues. That's my thing, not yours. On youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And we do have a Patreon as well, too, which is patreon.com forward slash TGT media. You know, I do this for free. I promote this for free. I push this on social media for free. Toss a couple of bucks to at least keep the lights on literally because <laughs> I just got a light over here too. <laughs> help me out if you so choose to support this channel in the future. And of course, and as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.